Um, hello, welcome. So happy to be with you guys tonight. Um, and just to kind of tag on to what Matt was saying, um, we just have a bunch of stuff happening this month. It's going to be so great, starting on Friday. So this first group gets here on Friday, and then we go for five weeks with a lot, a lot of stuff. So just to give you an idea, like at Dillon Valley Elementary, we'll have some kids over there reading with students and making copies and be helping in the lunchroom or whatever. We'll have making a few meals for fire department shifts. Um, We'll have people in people's homes, like doing stuff that they can't do, like knocking ice off of roofs or taking care of their kids or whatever. We'll have a parents night out here one of the nights where parents can just drop off their kids. We don't care who they are. They don't have to be a part of our church. They don't have to ever come. We just want to serve. Um, We're going to be passing out cookies like crazy people. So we're going to start making those this week. So if you want to help with that, that'd be awesome. And just kind of gearing up for getting the word out about our church, honestly, is part of it. And then the other part of it is the word that we get out about our church. We want it to be they help people and they love people and they're truly kind, even if it doesn't benefit us in any way. So, so there's a combination of all those things happening in March, and we're really, really excited for you guys to be a part of it. And so since we're going to be doing mission all the time, we're also going to be preaching about mission on Sunday nights for the next six weeks to whenever. <laughs> I always say, like, for the next two months, and then it ends up being way longer. Um, so I won't put a limit on it, but we are going to be, we're going to be sharing about the mission of God for the next several weeks. And... Um, Pastor Eric will come next week and talk about what the mission is, and over the context of the weeks, we'll be doing it, honestly. I mean, and you are already doing it. If you're sharing Jesus with people, wherever you work and whatever you do and whoever you come in contact with, there are very quick passing ways that we share. There are more intense, permanent ways that we share. There's lots of different ways that we go on mission for God, but we are going to be doing some of them in the next month with a bunch more people. So I think 90, I think 94 is the latest tally just with the extras, you know, some interns from last year jumping on or whatever. So 94 people is a couple times more than our church, you know, so it helps to have those extra people in town. But really what we're doing is just adding on to and jumping forward with what we're already doing in our lives. It's just kind of a corporate level that we haven't been able to uh, to do until we have this group. And I hope next year we outnumber them by, by many times, you know, but <laughs> we're, we're building toward that. And so meanwhile, they bring all this energy in and all this, we call it D1, unconscious incompetence, <laughs> where they're like, we're going to just totally change this county for one week while we're here. And we're like, yeah, okay, great. Pass out cookies and tell people that, you know, God is good. Um, and they're wonderful. And so we're going to jump on with them. But th- there are many, many ways that you will see mission done and many, many more ways that you have in your mind Um, Because of how you're wired, how God has uniquely gifted you, it comes naturally for you to live out mission. What we want to make sure is that after the next couple months, we can't leave here without knowing that we are a part of it, that we are to be doing it. Um, Because honestly, uh, I don't know that there are practical tools put in most Christians' hands to say this is how we reach the world. And that is the goal, is we are here to help reach the world. And um, it doesn't help to just preach sermons that are nice and say, we should do this. And everybody say, okay, what do I do now? Go knock on my neighbor's door or something horribly unnatural like that and try to give them a tract or something. I mean, God might lead you to do that, but that's not how I would prefer. That is the only way I was taught growing up. Something unbelievably unnatural, but you really need to do it because Jesus loves people and I love people and I don't know any other way to do it. So hopefully by the end of these weeks, you will have some other ideas and we maybe, I hope, could even get some testimonies of the things that people are trying and doing and reaching out a little bit to share who Jesus is. Well, next week, like I said, Eric's going to talk about what the mission is. This week, I felt like I should just start off with, why should we care? (laughs) Why should we care about this stuff? Why mission, you know? Why do we have to be a part of it, really? I mean, we're we're good, right? We know Jesus. All's well. You know, we kind of can just go on with our lives and not really understand that, that we need to be a part of this. And so before we talk about what and the, the what and how and all these different things, let's talk about why. Why do we need to actually be engaged in this mission with God? Well, the answer has to do with who we are. We are disciples. Now, The word disciple, I think, how many people here you've ever heard disciple used in the context of, like, Christianity? Yeah? Okay. So it's been talked about enough that we kind of know, like, all right, there's this disciple thing that we're supposed to be and we're supposed to do. But to be be frank, we don't know much about what that looks like at all because we don't do discipling in our culture today. This word and this term and this relationship is taken from 
Jewish culture where every disciple followed a what? Rabbi. Now, other than Jewish folks and sometimes very Orthodox Jewish folks, we don't see rabbis very often in our culture. Therefore, we don't really have a context for what a disciple is or what a disciple should do. And so I want to kind of dig into that a little bit tonight because I really feel like we first have to understand why we should care about this mission before we are, I want to, I want to inspire, we want to be encouraging, we want to be giving tools the whole time to say, let's go do it. Let's go do it together. Like in a few weeks, we'll be talking about oikos and what it means to be a family on mission, what it means to be engaged in discipleship together as a family, not alone, but together. And so we're going to be talking about all those different aspects, but really why? Because we are disciples. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what it meant to follow a rabbi. So I'm going to dive a little bit, and I hope this is interesting, and you guys learned something from this, because I really felt like this is what the Lord wanted me to share tonight, which is kind of about rabbinical culture and education, just so you understand kind of the background. And I guarantee you by the end of this, as you are reading through the Gospels especially, more things will come to life and make sense to you as you're reading some of these words than maybe they did before. Um, So let me just start with a a disciple's education. So I want to just explain to you what would happen when a disciple started going through their training. The very first stage in a disciple's training was called Bet Sefer, the house of the book. Now this is when a little boy, it was only little boys, okay? Women were not trained as disciples in that culture. Six to ten years old, they would memorize the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now, that would be Cadence, my oldest, who is going to be six next month. He would be starting to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Every single Jewish boy did this, okay? Every one of them. So even though we know that the disciples were unlearned and uneducated, they knew a whole lot more scripture, and I don't know how much they remembered two decades later, but, I mean, they had memorized this at one point, memorized it, okay, which means... Uh, you start at the beginning and you say it till the end, right? And uh, this just absolutely floors me that at six to ten years old, they're kind of picking through and able to see this guy's got it, that guy doesn't. You know, so they're kind of establishing over the course of this which kids were really cut out to one day be rabbis. So the ones that really are, and most young men would go into the second stage, which was called Bet Talmud, the house of learning. And these were boys 11 to 14 years old. And in these few years, these about four years, they memorized the rest of the Hebrew Bible, which is through Malachi. They ever looked at how big the the Old Testament is compared to the New Testament? If you open up your Bible in the middle. Now, London just turned 15 last week. So London would literally have memorized the entire Old Testament scriptures. Think think about that for a second. Now, not everybody got through this stage, okay? (laughs) Sometimes about halfway through, people would be dropping off, dropping out, like, nope, I'm going to go back to the family business, I'm going to be a carpenter. This is not the kind of life that I am cut out for, nor do I want. It was a very elite, very intellectual crowd that got to be rabbis and got to be disciples. The only way you got to be a disciple is if one day you were going to be a rabbi, okay? There's no way to have one without the other. If you made the cut to be a disciple, one day you would be a rabbi, and not a whole lot of people got to do that. So by this point, a lot of people have been filtered out, and if you have made the cut... You enter the last stage, Bet Midrash, which is the house of study. These are kids 15 and up. And what they did for this was they found a rabbi that they would want to study under based on his yoke. Y-O-K-E, yoke. Now, a yoke was what they called the, the particular stream of interpretation that a rabbi had. So my yoke would be, you know, these teachings and these interpretations. Another rabbi's yoke would be these over here. It kind of was like, it's all the same scripture, but different people's teachings, right? So we can kind of wrap our heads around that a little bit. It was kind of like going to a university and picking out one professor and learning from that one professor for the rest of your life, okay? You didn't go and sit in classrooms anymore. You attached yourself to that person. So they went through this process of selecting which rabbi they wanted to serve under, and then they had to go ask, Rabbis did not come ask you if you would like to follow them, okay? That never happened. Rabbis were elite. They were proud for good reason. They had worked their way up for a good reason. They are not about to step outside their little castle and say, hey, you. They didn't do that. People came to them and made application. And so they would grill these young men on the Torah, 
on the oral law, which is like, this rabbi says this, but this rabbi says this. I mean, they had to memorize so much and be able to kind of argue back and forth because these disciples were going to be arguing with other people's disciples about the correct interpretation. That's what they did. And so they had to make sure they were going to be really good disciples. And if they made it through all of that, then the young man was accepted as a Talmud, is the word for disciple, into the Talmudim, which is the discipleship huddle, if you will. (laughs) Just joking, but kind of. So it was kind of the smallish group of disciples. Now, of course, there were other disciples who would hear about the rabbi's learnings, but there was kind of the small crowd, the Talmudim. And when they were invited in, here's how the words were spoken. Take my yoke and follow after me. When a rabbi invited someone into that relationship, it was what every person applying for discipleship wanted to hear. You think that I'm good enough. You think that I can actually achieve what you are. Because that's what they're saying. You will not only believe like me, which would take a great deal of work, because really all these guys did all day long was study the scriptures and study the other things that people said about the scriptures and talk about it and argue about the scriptures. So to even just get to the intellectual ascent of where your rabbi was, was, was pretty difficult. It was a heavy yoke. You left your father, you left your mother, you left your community, you left your synagogue. This was a, a, an environment, a community a culture, rich and extended family. So to say you were going to pick up and leave, people didn't pick up and leave the way we do today. They didn't do that back then. You were picking up and leaving, and you would go live with the rabbi and the Talmudim. They lived together. Where you would not only hear what the rabbi said, but you would see how he lived. Okay, so there are two sides to it. One is what they say. You've got to believe it. You've got to understand it. And the other part is you've got to be like him. So it didn't stop at okay, we're all in the classroom, we're taking the test, I made an A, now I'm going to go home and go back to my life. You were really, really up close to this rabbi. You watched how he spoke to his children at dinner. You watched how he spoke to his wife. I mean, there are all sorts of creepy stories about disciples ending up in rabbis like bathrooms just to observe their practices. You know, like you were supposed to be just like this person. You were supposed to do every single thing the way they did. And there was a, a blessing that was spoken over a Talmud when he was accepted into this discipleship relationship. And the blessing said, may you be covered by the dust of your rabbi's feet. May you be covered by the dust of your rabbi's feet. What does that mean? May you be walking so closely, one foot in front of the other, exactly where his foot just left. You step there so much so that everything that's kicked up, and I got to tell you, in the Eastern world in this day, they walked a lot, and it wasn't just dust that was getting kicked up from the ground. You know what I'm saying? It was nasty. That's why foot washing was really gross. And that's why like the lowest servant did it. We cannot even conceive of that because we wear shoes and we ride in cars, but it was nasty. And it didn't matter though. To a disciple, it was almost like a badge of honor. The more junk you had on you, when you rolled into a city to teach, they were like, hmm, that disciple is looking bad. He must stick really close to his rabbi. We want to be covered by the dust from the rabbi's feet. That's the point of being a disciple. If they didn't pass, okay, now if they did pass, what would happen is they would serve their whole life alongside this rabbi under the rabbi's particular yoke. They would argue for them, make other disciples for them, and eventually they would become a rabbi. And if they were smart enough, they'd have their own kind of like interpretations and yoke. If not, they'd just keep making disciples for the rabbis. You served under his authority everywhere you went. Because if I go to a new town, I mean, you could Google me, right? But they didn't do that in that day. So when you went into a new town, they'd say, now whose authority... Are you under teaching this stuff? And you say, oh, yeah, 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 rabbi so-and-so. And, oh, I've heard of him. Okay, go ahead, proceed. So you served under this man's authority until you became kind of your own rabbi and started your own little Talmudim. And generation after generation after generation, this propagated. Okay? Now, when Jesus talks about being a disciple, the people who heard him say that, now, I don't know if any of that information is new to you. None of that would have been new to them. They would have assumed all of that when he talks about following him and becoming his disciple. If you ever notice in the New Testament, even the religious leaders call him rabbi. Everybody sees the amazing authority that he has to be able to teach, even though he didn't go through their system, which really ticked them off. But if they didn't pass, they went back to their families. 
you know, whatever stage, and they learn the family trade. Now, they didn't go back home and say, <clears throat> now I need to take some, some classes at the community college and figure out what I want to do with my life. Like, nobody in that day did that. There was no freedom to choose what you did with your vocation. You did what your father did, and your father did what his father did. And Jesus' family were tecton, builders, actually more likely with stone than with wood, because that's what they had to build with that day. That's what his whole family was. It wasn't just him. It was all his brothers. It was his father. It was their fathers. It was this whole little community of builders. And that's, when you look at uh, Simon Peter and Andrew, and there were fishermen, you, you notice like after Jesus dies, they go back to fishing. Like this is what they know how to do. This is what they've been trained how to do their whole lives. So that's what people would do if they weren't received into that. And that's where we find the disciples, right? When Jesus calls them. Which tells us what? They didn't make the cut with anybody else, right? <laughs> and so Jesus' whole way of doing this is so completely different. There are some ways that he worked within this system, okay? We can kind of take a look at kind of what he did, how he discipled, and kind of get a picture of, okay, this makes sense. It's sort of a reflection of the culture of the day. That's why it's really important for us to understand it. Because if we don't understand what they would have understood in that day, we, we, when we read it, it's going to be like, hmm, Follow me, authority, yoke, you know, none of that means much. But when we understand all of those things and we dig into it, we can think, oh, man, this is, there's a complete whole world around this. And this is part of the reason that he used that culture of the day. I believe it's even possible that Jesus came at that time in history in that culture so he could use that imagery. And he could teach us this is what it means to be a God server, is to be a disciple the way a disciple would follow a rabbi. Very, very important imagery and pictures and all those things. But there were some really significant ways that he departed from what they did in that culture too. The first one is one of the big, big differences in Jesus' way of doing discipleship was the way he received his authority. Now remember, they received their authority from human rabbis, people who had a whole lot of learning and a rapport that people had maybe heard about or sat under or seemed to know what they were talking about. And Jesus didn't, as far as we can see in the Bible, he never served under any rabbi, right? Now, you can't be a rabbi if you never served with a rabbi. That's the way the system goes. That's why John the Baptist made them so angry because it's pretty clear John the Baptist never, <laughs> you know, he never served, he never joined a Talmud even like studied under anybody. He just started preaching and he preached with such authority people didn't know what to do with them because there was a system in place. There's a procedure for how people do this, right? But Jesus didn't fit under the procedure. He had no authority from human voices, right? When he rolled into a city and they said, mm, where'd you come from? You're saying stuff that's like, it's like scriptural and it kind of makes sense and it's super authoritative, but it's not anything we've ever heard before. I mean, look at this in Matthew 21. When Jesus returned to the temple and began teaching, now he had just done some pretty crazy stuff. He had gone into the temple, and it's called the temple cleansing, where he kicks everybody out and throws over temp tables because they're basically using the sacrifice, the system of sacrifice for gain. So they're selling people all these things, and he's just, he's just angry. And he starts dumping things over. He's teaching stuff that people have never heard before. And so when he returns to the temple and began teaching, the leading priests and elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right and what they want to know is, what human authority have you been leaning on? And can you point to, to say, this guy knows what he's talking about? Who's your rabbi? What scribe, what Pharisee is going to speak for you? And Jesus says, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things if you answer one question. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven, or was it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he'll ask us why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, we'll be mobbed because the people believe John was a prophet. So they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. I mean, he just, he's just genius, brilliant. All the time, he's like trapping them in their own words. I mean, basically what he's saying is, I don't need your authority. I don't need anybody to speak for me. I mean, this is, think about some of the reasons that they became so angry with him. When he would say things like, you've heard it said, so Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, you've heard it said this. Now, they were used to hearing that, but usually what would follow is, but this other guy says this, okay? It's a way that they kind of, they kind of uh, traded off this oral law. This guy says this, but this guy says this, and I don't know, it's probably somewhere in the middle. That's how they learned. 
And what Jesus does, he doesn't say, you've heard it said, do not murder. But Rabbi blah, blah, blah says this. He says, but I say to you, even if you hate someone in your heart, you've already murdered them. So don't do that either. I mean, he is, now, have you ever thought of that in that way? That he is actually putting himself in the place of someone that by human standards, he has no right. Even though they call him rabbi because it's so obvious that he knows a whole lot and he understands a lot and he has this wisdom, he's not been through the system and he doesn't really care. He speaks on the authority that the father gave him with no apology. Uh, It is unbelievable to me sometimes when I sit back and look at just the authority, never in a hurry, never too slow, never apologizing, never trying to prove himself. I mean, Jesus just kind of knew who he was, which is what authority means. Authority comes from identity. And so when he knew who he was, the authority just flowed. And he didn't really need anybody to believe him or to agree with him. Except the father. In John five nineteen, Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. Can you imagine being able to say that? I don't do anything. I get up in the morning. I don't say anything. I don't do anything. I don't not do anything. I don't, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. Now, that's the goal <laughs> for me. I mean, that would be amazing to be able to say, oh, he didn't tell me to go there. I mean, there are things that Jesus does that don't even make sense in his ministry. It's because the father told him that. And everybody else around him is like, hold on a second. We've got like thousands and thousands of people thronging us and you want to go somewhere else? That is a really bad church planting strategy. And he's like, yeah, I just went and talked to the father and he wants, he wants us to go somewhere else. So that's what we're going to do. I mean, he never apologized, never backed down, just was who he was. Now today, Jesus still has authority from the father. And if we are his disciples... It also belongs to us. I think about that. Nobody needs to, I mean, people do affirm it, you know, like we do in each other. We see that in each other. I guess if nobody affirms it, it might be a red flag. <laughs> Something's not right. But really, we don't need people's affirmation to be a disciple. We don't need to walk into a place and someone say, who gave you the authority to teach like this? Jesus? Okay. That's good. We have authority because we have identity in Christ. Covenant. We have the same authority that Jesus had. The second thing that he did that was different is the way he chose his disciples, right? Remember what I said before? Rabbis don't go looking for people. They sure don't select people who haven't been through a very rigorous process to to shave out every single person except the very, 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 very top of the elite. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. That is not something that rabbis did. And certainly not the greatest one who would ever live, who also happened to be God and the Savior of the world. He went and found them. That is a massive reversal and really good news. Because that means that he also comes and finds us. That he took the first step out. I mean, Peter and Andrew would have fished their whole lives if Jesus had not given the invitation. Hey, I know that nobody ever thought you were good enough. I mean, they were two of those little boys in Hebrew school who didn't make the cut. You know what I'm saying? Nobody ever thought you were good enough. You weren't intellectual enough. You probably weren't holy enough. Let's be real. They chose them based on that too. You weren't any of the things that anybody thought you should be. But I think you can not only believe like me, I think you can be like me. And what kind of affirmation is that to a person? Come and follow me. No wonder they dropped everything and left. Why wouldn't you? If someone like Jesus believes I can be something like him, let's do it, you know? They left everything. He called all sorts of people and he went to them. Think about how crazy it would be in that day to be a woman. Literally in the history of this structure, there had never been a female disciple. It's not possible. It's an oxymoron. You cannot be a woman disciple. And yet everywhere Jesus went, he welcomed people. No wonder women followed him and supported his ministry. It's the first time anybody had ever called them a disciple of anybody, and they got to be Jesus' disciples. I mean, he stopped and gave worth and value to people who had never been good enough. That's how he calls disciples. 
It wasn't their intelligence, flawless character, seemingly good gifts and talents. He wanted those who the Spirit of God could change and use for the kingdom of God. That's what he saw. You are available and you are moldable and you will come with me. Now he called all sorts of people who didn't come, right? (laughs) And he let them go. Think about his yoke. Matthew 11, Jesus said, come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Now the first interpretation, the first layer of that is literally a yoke that they would put on two oxen which is where the word came from in the first place with the way rabbis. And when you've read this, you've probably thought about this before. So when a young, young ox would come into the family, livestock family, you know, and start to work alongside, it was all energetic and ready to go. And he's going to tear it up in like four hours. And the older ox knows this is going to be 14-hour days. So they would yoke them together so that one didn't run ahead and one didn't fall behind, that they could just bang out the steady rhythms of what they needed to do and get through the day without killing themselves. And that's the idea of a yoke. That's, that's what we mean by discipleship. If you remember in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, don't yoke yourself together with an unbeliever. He's talking about very intimate relationships. Do not find yourself in that yoke because someone's going to go one way or the other and who knows which way it's going to end up, right? We yoke ourselves with people who are headed the same direction, that we kind of, one's going faster, one's going slower all the time. That's the way relationships are. That's the way it works. But they're people that are going the same way. Well, the second layer is this rabbinical yoke, right? And when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, everybody who heard it would have thought of this. Every, every other rabbi's yoke is really heavy. And it, and, and it costs a lot, but like for nothing. Like, what do you get out of this deal? And Jesus says, my yoke, unlike everybody else's that you've ever seen, is light. It's easy. Why is that? Because when we're yoked to him, he takes all of the burden. At least he should. It almost makes me think of like a massive, you know, like linebacker on one side of the yoke and like a little three-year-old boy on the other, just like kind of dangling. You know, the big guy is taking on the weight, right? The other person's not doing a whole lot, but they're still walking together. And that's why I think of Jesus yoked to me. I'm not doing much. And he gives me the, not only permission, but in implores me to give me all his burdens all the time and so because he's able to bear it and I'm not and so his yoke is that light isn't that amazing he says come follow me I believe in you you can do this and I'm gonna make it light that doesn't mean that it doesn't cost them anything right because all we have to do is read a couple pages in the new testament especially in the gospels to see what it costs Luke 18, 18 through 23. All these scriptures are in the bulletin and stuff if you want to look these up later. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. So clearly this man is looking for something else, right? If he has obeyed all of these commandments, he's done the legalistic rule following thing, but somehow in his heart he knows it's just really not enough. And so he comes and seeks out this amazing man that everybody's talking about that's helping people and healing people and teaching these crazy extraordinary things. And he comes to him to say, what else can I do to inherit this? Because I've done all that other stuff and it's not really doing it for me because legalism doesn't. And Jesus, hearing his answer, he said, there's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Clearly, the man was not following Jesus before. He was good, but he wasn't really a disciple. I know that's hard for us to wrap our heads around, but that's the way it is. He says, go and get rid of the thing that you love the most. For other people, it was their family relationships, ties for other, it was all sorts of things. People would come to him and say, I want to follow you. And he'd say, well, then go get rid of that. And they'd say, "Uh uh-uh. And this man, when the man heard this, he became very sad for he was very rich. Now, a rich person could have done that, but this man decided not to. The cost was too great. 
And I don't see Jesus running after him saying, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Everything you have was maybe a little steep, like maybe half, half of what you have, maybe a tenth, a tithe. Jesus never watered down anything for people. He kept the cost at everything every time. The beauty of it, what balanced it, is that we get everything from him. We give up everything to gain everything. We give up everything for all kinds of things. I have seen people give, I've seen young women give up their virginity just to be pleasing in some guy's sight. What is that? We give up stuff all the time. I've seen people give up relationships to chase after money. I mean, we give up things nonstop for which we receive nothing of life, right? All the time, we've given up one thing to get something else that is not life-giving. And yet Jesus says, you've already given up everything for something. Just give it up for me. Because you're going to get eternal life. You're going to get joy. You're going to get love. You're going to get mercy. And you get to come on mission with me, which is the greatest gift, I think, other than salvation that he could possibly give us. I'm not going to just take you and stick you somewhere to watch. I actually believe that you could do this thing with me. What? (laughs) That's crazy. Why should I be able to do that with him? I mean, seriously, God could split the sky today and show everybody, I am who I say I am, believe in me. I'm not sure why he doesn't do it. Because his other plan, which is us, doesn't look all that great sometimes in the light of day. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I'm like, you could be doing this a whole lot easier for all of us. And for whatever reason, he's chosen to use us. That's kingdom, right? He takes us, he makes us our children, his children, which is the covenant part. He gives us an identity. He gives us a new name. He says, you are important to me because of who you are. And then he says, now go do stuff. You're not just a nice little girl for the rest of your life, a pretty, pretty princess, you know, who gets to dress up in her daddy's, you know, closet or whatever. (laughs) So much weird stuff out there these days, I'm telling you. You're also kind of like a warrior, You have a birthright, which is to make disciples that make disciples. And thank goodness he doesn't steal that from us because he thinks that we're going to crumple up and die the first time we fail or something doesn't go our way. He's really good like that. Like he'll keep pushing us and pushing us and pushing us until we reach our full potential. That's God. I am so glad because I don't really want to give my life for anything else. And the last way that he departed was, he departed from it was the way he taught with words and actions. Jesus taught about the kingdom, and he showed the kingdom. He taught about the kingdom, and he showed the kingdom. He would do a teaching, and then he'd go out and heal people. He would teach people, uh, you know, a parable, and then he'd go raise somebody from the dead. I mean, he never stopped teaching the kingdom and showing the kingdom. That's all he did his whole life. That was what it meant. Now, rabbis didn't do that. They taught. They used a lot of words. They didn't do much for anybody. That really wasn't what they were expected to do. They were just expected to, like, interpret stuff and teach and talk a lot. Jesus sometimes just zipped it and went out and did it, right? And that's what we are to do as disciples of him too. I could give you so many examples, but this is the way that Peter kind of summarizes it in Acts 10. He's preaching to Cornelius' family after that crazy experience with Cornelius. And he says this, he says, You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism? And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He's like, here's what happened. You've heard about it. I mean, they talk about this all the way way through the New Testament. People are always using these words like, as you know, (laughs) because everybody heard about this stuff that was going on. And this is just a summary. This is the stuff he did. He went around doing good and healing people. And he taught a lot about the kingdom. Now, we tend to want to go one way or the other. We want to talk a lot and never do anything. Or want to go do stuff and love people. I mean, it's so funny. We talked about this in our huddle the other night. That the, the words, preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. Right? The point of that and what that's supposed to do is say, it's not enough to just say words all the time. We need to love people. We're preaching the gospel when we're never saying anything by just how we love people. And there are a thousand different ways we do that all the time. Right? I mean, I keep these $5 gift cards in my, in my purse literally for that purpose. I got to give one away this week, and a woman was just, like, crying practically by the time I left. And I never said anything about Jesus. Just did something small, you know? And that, there's so many different ways we can do stuff like that. But sometimes we've also got to speak words. Like, sometimes that thing becomes an excuse for us to say, well, I'm preaching the gospel without the words. 
Yeah, but sometimes people need to know Jesus is real. Jesus is God. Jesus is awesome. Jesus has changed my life, and he can do the same for you. He taught about it, and he did it, right? And then we see his disciples doing it. Now, their rabbi, that's what he did. And so what does a disciple do? Whatever his rabbi does. And so in Acts 3, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. He's doing the same thing he's done every single day, just asking people for money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. The lame man looked at him eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. As he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. So the, the rabbi did it. His early disciples did it. And what about us? Do you think we can do things like that? Now, now me, I want to say, I think so, but I don't really believe that that's actually going to happen with me. I can maybe believe he'll do it through Jennifer, you know, or he'll do it through Edward. But to do it through me, but here's the deal. It's not about us. It's about following the rabbi and doing what he did. I definitely don't think Peter woke up that morning and thought, I am so awesome that I'm going to go find some person and show off. That's how we think of it, though, right? If God actually healed someone through me, I would be so proud, and I would be, my ego would just increase. That's not how it happens. That's not what happens. Jesus gets the glory for it. God gets the glory for it. But all Peter does is see someone who's in need, and he's like, I can't help you any other way. I don't have any financial capital. I got the spiritual capital. I can lay my hands on you or just grab you by the hand, and up you come. And for the rest of his life, the man had financial capital because he could actually work, right? <laughs> Now, we are his disciples. Remember what a disciple is? Someone who does the things Jesus did for the reasons he did them. Someone who does the things Jesus did for the reasons he did them. All the reasons part. That's what we've been trying to get down for years. God, could we please just learn how to love people? Could we please get our motives right? Could we please get ourselves out of the way? The reasons are really important because we can try to just do all the stuff in a really flashy you know, self-important way. I've, I've seen it. It's not pretty. It has unlimited potential for harm. But once we get to that point, it's kind of just nice and cozy to just stay there, right? <laughs> I love people now. This is good. I'm just going to stay right here. And we don't actually sometimes do the things Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He taught about the kingdom and he showed the kingdom. That's the kingdom part, right? We have to wrap our heads around. What does that mean for me? I don't know what that means for you. I don't know what it, what it would be like for you to stretch yourself a little bit this week, to wake up in the morning and say, I'm a disciple. And as Matthew 28 tells us, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Remember, this is the last thing he says to them in his physical presence. He's just about to go up to heaven. It's the very last thing he says. It's really, really, really important. He's not going to say anything in that instant that's not super crazy important. And this is what he says. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Duh. Right? <laughs> that we know. I mean, you're walking on water and stuff and like raising people up from the dead. We get it. You, you came out of a tomb after three days. We get that you have authority. Now, there's a little piece in there that's not explicitly stated, but any disciple of the day would have put in another sentence in their brains that said, and as my disciples, I now give it to you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's called the Great Commission. He says, I've been given authority, and now I give it to you. I know it doesn't say it there, but that is implied. Because then he says, now just go and do stuff. Teach people. Do all the things that you've seen me do. Everything you've seen me do, you go do. That is the mission of God. Why should we care? Because our rabbi cares. 
because he gave up everything to come here for us and he didn't have to. He could have loved us and felt bad for us from heaven. Instead, he came here and he bore all of that junk and all of that rejection and all of that hatred and all of that pain and he died on a cross, a, a, a death so painful that they made up a new word for it, excruciating comes from a death on the cross because there was no other word that could explain how painful and horrible that death was. He did all of that because he was on mission. Probably not going to require the same thing from us, (laughs) but it's going to definitely require something. And if I know him, if I love him, if I've received from him, if I'm sitting in covenant relationship with my father and his heart is breaking for something, then my heart should break too. That's why we should care because our rabbi cares. And wherever he goes and whatever he does, that's where we need to be, covered by the dust of his feet. And where Jesus goes is where people are not popular and they're not pretty and they don't have much together and they're mistreated and they're looked down upon. And he goes to the rich and the powerful and the religious. He went to all of them. It's just most of the religious and rich people didn't want to eat with the prostitutes and sinners, so they didn't stick around for long. But he went everywhere. And that's what he calls us to do. Go. Would you just bow your head? Like I said, I hope something (laughs) somewhere in that pile of information was helpful in understanding mission and understanding a whole lot more. I truly hope that just even this little piece that you've had tonight will help you as you're reading through to understand some of these dynamics a whole lot better. Regardless, The call to be a disciple is the call to follow a specific rabbi. And what Jesus is calling to is saying, will you follow me? Will you take up my yoke? Not only will you believe the way I do about the kingdom of God, but will you be like me? And so I just want to ask tonight, nobody looking around, just everybody with your eyes closed. I'm the only one with my eyes open. I want to ask you tonight, if you've never made that decision Maybe Jesus has been kind of part of your life. It's been, he's been on the periphery. You're like, fine, sure, why not? You know, if it's, if it's convenient, but you've never really dug in all the way to the point where it really costs you everything. And you would say tonight, I don't really know what else to do, but I think he's calling my name. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it's going to mean for me, but I think I want to follow him. I'm just going to ask you to lift up your face and make eye contact with me so that I know who you are. Oh, God, you're so good. Thank you, Jesus, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light, that you don't need something from us, that you're not asking, always, always demanding so that we're never enough. We are enough for you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving everything for us when we were absolutely unlovable and still are on many days. Thank you for being that kind of God. You don't have to be like that. We would follow you anyway because of your power and your might and your holiness, but your love and your mercy draws us in. So what else can we do but follow you? What else would we do with our lives? Thank you, Jesus that you offer us everything that the kingdom has. You offer us all that life and all that authority. You give us your approval and then you say, go out and show other people how good I am. Thank you for your mission. Thank you for believing in us 